Welcome, and thank you for viewing our weekly sermon. I'm Pastor Malone, and I pray this message be a blessing to you and help you grow closer to Jesus. If you'd like to know more about having a personal relationship with Jesus or to connect with us as a church, please visit westacres.org. Thanks again, and God bless. invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at verse 17 through 26 today. If you don't have a Bible, I do want to just say we have some available in the pews. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible at all, that is our gift to you today. Um, so please be sure to follow along. But once you've found your place, please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. And this is Peter preaching. Uh, we started his sermon last week. We're picking up in verse 17. And he says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is living. Your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. Um, Lord, and I just pray that uh, you will cut us with your word today. Lord, you'll open our eyes to your word. Help us understand this truth. Uh, not only understanding this truth, help us uh, in responding to this truth. Uh, whatever your will is for your church, whatever your will is for uh, the individuals who have made uh, their way uh, to church this morning, to this gathering. Uh, Father, I pray that we will be blessed by this time and that it not be in vain. Um, Father, in my weakness, I, I pray that you will be powerful. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be the preacher today, as always. Father, uh, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today we're looking at the conclusion of Peter's second sermon in the book of Acts. Some of y'all are like, okay, I am totally lost. I haven't been here. I don't know what he's talking about. Bear with me. Uh, let me give you a recap. Let me give you a recap if you're just joining us today and you're in the middle of this sermon. Uh, this message was preached after a great miracle took place. That miracle was the healing of a lame beggar who sat at the beautiful gate at the temple. He sat outside the temple, always asking for alms. It's found at the beginning of Acts 3. And what we know about this lame beggar was that he wasn't someone that... Uh, lost his ability to walk. He was someone that was born without the ability to walk. He had to be carried daily to the temple to beg. 
That was his livelihood. That was his only way of bringing money home. That was his way of surviving. And, but it was through the power of Jesus, through the power of Jesus, not the power of Peter, but through the power of Jesus, Peter healed this man and gave him his ability to walk. And he's not only walking, but we know that he is leaping, praising God. His life was completely changed. This man could now walk. He could now work. He could now worship. This miracle not only impacted this man, though, but it impacted the crowd that was at the temple on this day. Now, we read in the text, it says a great crowd gathered. They were running uh, to see this man who once was lame, but who was now walking and leaping. And once this crowd gathered around, we see that Peter seized the opportunity. He didn't have intentions to preach a sermon that day. He hadn't done sermon prep that day, uh, that week. He went to the temple to pray. But he seized the opportunity. He was ready to preach the message God had given him. And folks, his preaching was very similar to his preaching on the day of Pentecost. If you look at this sermon and his sermon on the day of Pentecost, there are so many similarities but the main thing that's similar is Peter preached about Jesus. He preached Christ. He proclaimed Jesus as Israel's Messiah. But he also did this. He stepped on some toes. He indicted the people for their sin. What was their sin? Their sin was playing a part in the crucifixion of Jesus. Their sin was killing their own Messiah. Peter was bold and direct in his preaching. He was not sensitive. Peter was not politically correct. Uh, I mean, he would be canceled in a heartbeat if he was preaching today in the United States. He preached the truth and nothing but the truth. He not only indicts the people for their sin. He not only indicts them for their sin, pointing out their sin, but he gives them a very clear verdict. A very clear verdict. Picture a courtroom. These people are guilty, guilty of killing Jesus. They were guilty. Perhaps you're familiar with uh, the legal system in America. Maybe you've been on, uh, been on jury duty. Maybe you've been a defendant. I don't know what your story is. But it, perhaps you're familiar with the way we do trials here in the United States. Uh, we just had a high-profile murder trial uh, televised across our nation. I know uh, some of you caught a glimpse of that trial. We always, we all, we're always captivated by these, these big stories that are taking place in our nation. But the defendant that was standing trial, what did the jury find him? Guilty. Guilty. And what happens after the verdict of guilty is given? The bailiff comes with the handcuffs and takes that person away. Now they get to come back and they get to hear their sentencing, but they are carried away. You're no longer a defendant at that point. You are convicted. You are guilty. Peter's sermon gave a guilty verdict to the Jews in Jerusalem. However, the people in this story are not carried away by a bailiff. They're not carried away to jail or prison. Moreover, they're not even carried away to eternal judgment. That's because this story, this sermon, does not end with the people's guilt. This sermon doesn't end with you are guilty. This sermon ends with God's grace. It ends with God's grace, and that's the way all of our stories should end, by the way. We all stand here guilty today, but you don't have to stand guilty. You can know what the amazing grace of God is. And in this sermon, Peter is going to conclude with a gracious offer of forgiveness. He has just laid it out to him. Uh, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's also said, you have killed him. You handed him over to Pilate. You denied him from Pilate when Pilate tried to release him. You chose Barabbas, the notorious murderer, over Jesus. Moreover, you were the ones that said his blood be on us and our children. You said yourself you are guilty. But Peter is going to give them a gracious offer of forgiveness. In this grace-filled conclusion, Peter speaks on three primary truths. The people's ignorance, the people's need of repentance, and finally, the people's prophetic inheritance. We'll explain all those. 
Let's begin with number one. The people's ignorance in verses 17 through 18. Uh, Peter picks up at this part of the sermon. This is part two after he has indicted the people. And it has been, it has been intense. It has been intense the way he has been speaking uh, to this Jewish audience at the Jewish temple, by the way. He says in verse 17, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your rulers. Peter said you acted in ignorance. In other words, Peter was saying, listen, I know you don't fully understand what you have done. You did not realize this was the servant of God. You did not realize this was the holy and righteous one. You did not realize this was the author of life. Yes, he was special. He was different. But you did not realize you have killed the Christ. Jesus himself pointed to the people's ignorance. You remember those gracious words on the cross when he was dying for your sins, my sins, and the sins of the world? He prayed to the Father, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus himself said his persecutors, those that were putting him through suffering, were ignorant. They don't even know what they're doing. Later, the Apostle Paul would tell the uh, church in Corinth, he would say 1 Corinthians 2.8, None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus said they were ignorant. Paul says they were ignorant. Peter says they were ignorant. So what does this mean for us so far? This means that they are not guilty of premeditated murder of the Messiah. This means they are not guilty of what we know is first degree murder. But what are they guilty for? They are guilty for manslaughter. They played a part in the slaying of the lamb. They are guilty for that. They didn't fully understand what they were doing. But listen to this. Just because the people did not know what they were doing, our text today tells us God knew what He was doing. Look at verse 18. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that His Christ would suffer, He thus fulfilled. It is here again we see God's sovereignty, God's sovereign plan, God's definite plan, but also the actions of sinful humans and human responsibility side by side. And folks, they don't contradict one another. It's a paradox in Scripture, but it exists. God is sovereign, but we are free moral agents who are responsible for our actions. We are responsible for our sins. Peter preached this same message in his first sermon. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 23. This Jesus... Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So there's two truths we have just been presented in verses 17 and 18. Let me present these truths to you again. Number one, these people are ignorant. They don't fully understand what they've done. That's number one. Number two, God's sovereign plan was fulfilled. Those are the two truths we have been presented. So let me ask this question to the jury. If the people were ignorant in the killing of Jesus, and Jesus' death was a part of God's definite plan, are these people still guilty? The answer is yes. Yes. They are still guilty. Let me I hate to spoil this for you if you've been trying to be ignorant. Ignorance does not excuse sin. You are still guilty. At the end of the day, you are still guilty. Sins of ignorance and those presumptuous sins, sins of the will, they are different in God's eyes. But at the end of the day, you stand guilty. You're guilty. In addition, God's sovereignty does not remove the people's guilt either, even though this was God's definite plan. He, his foreknowledge ordained all this to happen. The people are still guilty. 
God is sovereign, but man is a free moral agent who is responsible for his actions. Some of y'all's heads are just exploding right now. But what did I say previously when we were preaching on this subject in Acts chapter 2? That his ways are higher than our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. And God, thank you so much that your ways are higher than our ways. The people acted by their own hateful wills, but God used them to fulfill his plan. With that being said, this crowd, this, this group of people in Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem, they were guilty. They were guilty of killing Jesus. Even though they were ignorant, even though this was a part of God's sovereign plan, they are guilty. They played a part by choice. So what does that mean if they're guilty? That means that these people, just like everybody that's ever sinned, is in great need of forgiveness. They're in great need of forgiveness. But can I, can I tell you this? I don't know if we say this enough in the church today. Forgiveness is not automatic. Forgiveness is not automatic. And what am I trying to explain here? Yes, we preach Christ. Yes, we preach amazing grace. Yes, we preach about God's love. Yes, we preach about God's forgiveness. But this forgiveness is not automatic. Someone that hears the good news of Jesus Christ, you can't just say, wow, that's good. <laughs> it is good. But it's even better when you respond to it. It's even better when you respond to it. You have to respond to this good news. You have to respond to the salvation that Jesus provides for you. You have to respond to it. It's not automatic. To be forgiven, Peter's going to lay it out for us. We must repent of our sins and come to Christ. We must repent of our sins and come to Christ. This brings us to our second heading. Uh, the people's need of repentance. Look at verse 19. It says, repent therefore and turn back. Repent therefore and turn back. What does repent mean? I know that is a churchy word. Some people feel like it's a word from the 1950s that somebody in the 50s just added this to the Bible to, to be a joy kill. Uh, but no, uh, we didn't add this to God's word. God gave it to us in his word. Uh, the word repent means to change one's mind or purpose, specifically in the area of sin. And this isn't just an intellectual decision. This isn't someone saying, wow, I really don't like sin. I'm going to just change my mind about it. It's not an intellectual decision, but it's a decision that takes over all of you. It's a decision that affects your behavior. So you not only change your mind about sin, but you also change your direction in regards to sin. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for your sin. Been there? Everybody should be raising their hands for this one. I've definitely felt sorry for my sin. That's not repentance, though. That's not repentance. Uh, sorrow can lead me to repentance, but you can feel sorrowful and remorseful over your sin all day long and never repent. Classic example, Judas Iscariot, the disciple that betrayed our Lord Jesus. The scripture says he was remorseful, but he never repented. What did it say he did? He killed himself. He killed himself. Judas felt remorse, but it never brought him to repentance. Alex, he opened up with a beautiful passage of Scripture today saying, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. That is a true statement. He is faithful to forgive us. But confessing sin is not uh, repenting of sin. I could have an open mic right here today, and y'all could line up and confess your sins all day long. And remain in your sin. You could feel sorrowful. You could cry. You could share it with others. And just stay happily in it. Those things are not repentance. What is repentance? Repentance should include sorrow. It should include confession. But repentance is ultimately forsaking your sin. It's forsaking it. You turn from it. You walk away. You say, I've had it. I've had enough of this. I don't want any more. And you go the other direction. You part ways with it. You part ways with it. I love this quote. It's remained with me over the years. It comes from a book called Holiness by J.C. Ryle. Listen to what he says 
about sin and the need to part from it. And tell me if this doesn't relate to you right now. Our sins are often as dear to us as our children. We love them, hug them, cleave to them, and delight in them. To part with them is as hard as cutting off a right hand or plucking out a right eye. But it must be done. The parting must come. It doesn't matter how difficult, how dear you may find your sins to be. When you start thinking like God does about your sin, remember what we sang early, break my heart for what breaks yours. You have to part with it. You have to say to yourself, this doesn't belong in my life because this doesn't belong with Christ. I can't have it. Peter tells the people to repent, which means to turn. He says, repent therefore and turn. So what is he saying essentially? Turn and turn. Turn and turn. He's essentially saying turn and turn. This means they're not only to turn from their sins, but they are to turn to Christ. When he says turn back, turn back, turn back to God. And who do we know that Christ is? He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He is God in flesh. They are to turn from their sins and turn to Him. For these Jews in Jerusalem, what did that mean? This means they needed to change their minds about Christ. They needed to change their verdict about Christ. This man was not just an imposter or blasphemer, but no, he indeed was the Son of God. That is the decision they would have to change their minds on. But also, they would have to come to Him as their Messiah, as their Savior, as their King. Let me explain this to you. To simply turn from sin is behavior change. For you to leave here today and you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. And you, and you, and you, kinda, you just turn from it. You might have changed the direction a little bit, but there's going to be something else that gets in your direction. That's why God tells us to not only turn from our sin, but to turn to Him. We replace the void of sin with Christ. We, we replace the, the, the counterfeit joys of sin with the genuine joys of holiness. It's a beautiful thing. So maybe if you've been stumbling, if you've been saying, I've been trying so hard, Pastor, to, to get this out of my life. I've been trying so hard not to do this. Let me ask you this. Are, are you just trying not hard? Are you trying hard not to do this? Or are you turning to Jesus? Are you turning to Him? You have to have both. If they would do this, Peter goes on to share three awesome benefits of repentance. And these, these benefits are very prevalent to the Jewish audience, but they're also prevalent to us. So let's check these benefits out. The first one is this. If they repent, their sins would be forgiven. Their sins would be forgiven. He says, repent therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Blotted out. I absolutely love how Peter illustrates God's forgiveness right there. Uh, he, he doesn't say that God's going to just one-line it. I mean, just picture your filing cabinet with all your sins, and God's just one-lined it. But, but that means somebody can creep in and just take a look. Be like, oh, man, look at what they've done. I can still read it because of that one line. Uh, God hasn't taken your sins and put it in the basements of hev heaven. He hasn't done any of those things. But Scripture says He has blotted it out. He has wiped it away. Let me share this. The phrase blot out or wipe away, it pictures the wiping of ink off a document. And unlike modern ink, ink in the ancient world had no acid content. There it did not bite into the papers or the parchment used for documents. Instead, it remained on the surface where it could easily be wiped away by a damp sponge. I am so glad that my sins are wiped away. That same term, wiped away, blotted out, erased. I like this term, obliterated, obliterated. Amen. Folks, if that doesn't just make you feel good, 
if that doesn't lead you to repentance, I don't know what will. Because I've got a lot of sin. And I don't ever want to be faced with it again. I want to know that my God has wiped it away. He has blotted it away. And folks, when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, He's not going to talk about any of my sins. Because they were obliterated on the cross. They were obliterated by Christ. They were erased. Now some of you might be thinking, it's easy enough for God to to forget our sins, to erase them, to obliterate them. But pastor, why am I still living with this? Why can't I forget? And I know sometimes that's a struggle. But remembrance is a good thing. Remembrance lets us know where we've been and where we are now. If we didn't have remembrance, we wouldn't know what full gratitude is. So remembrance is actually a good thing. It allows us to give praise to God that I am no longer where I used to be. I am no longer having to deal with the sins I used to live in. I am no longer having to deal with that pain and that sorrow because Christ has taken care of it all. That's a good deal to me. Secondly, the times of refreshing may come. Verse 20, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When a person repents of their sin and experiences the forgiveness of God, what better word can you say than refreshing? What better word can you say satisfaction, satisfying, forgiveness, holiness? It is refreshing. This is part of the abundant life Jesus says he came to give. He says, I came to give life and to give it abundantly. But some of you are here today thinking that, wow, I'm only going to praise God because I'm going to heaven. Folks, you're, you're, you're missing out on what all he has in store for you. He not only wants to give you eternal life, but he wants to give you abundant life that can start here and now, here and now. This refreshing also comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. What's His first name? Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us forever. And we are sealed by the Holy Spirit for all eternity. You know what that means? I can't lose my salvation. I can't lose it. Because if I could lose it, that means I could earn it. And I know the Bible says I can't earn it. So I know I can't lose it. So we are sealed with this Holy Spirit, which is refreshing However, when Peter talks here, remember who he's talking to. Let's go back to the context. He's speaking to the Jews. He's speaking to the Jews that crucified Jesus. He's speaking to the Jewish people. When he refers to times of refreshing, he is referring to the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom. What is that? What is that? Join us on Wednesday nights. You can learn all about it. Uh, Going through the book of Revelation. But as the thousand year reign of Christ, once he returns to this earth, thousand year reign on this earth in the flesh. You know what else the Bible says? We're going to be there with him. We're going to be there with him. This is going to take place in the future. Uh, I hold to the view that this is going to take place after the church is raptured. This is going to take place after the seven year period of tribulation that we read about in the book of Revelation. Uh, but Peter says these Jews will experience that kingdom if they repent. Which is true. They will experience that kingdom if they repent. But what's interesting here, Peter is preaching to these people as if if they would have repented then, the Messiah would have come. If they would have repented then, the Messiah would have come. Because that's what his word says. But what do we know about Israel? Peter's going to preach this sermon. 5,000 people, 5,000 men are going to get saved. I heard Adrian Rogers say, that's just the men. Think about all the ladies, because the ladies are are way more faithful than men. You you know they're there for the scene. I mean, thousands and thousands of people are saved this day at the temple. But that is not the majority of Israel. The majority of Israel is still going to reject their Messiah, and they still do to this day. They still do to this day. But Peter is saying this. The Messianic kingdom, the Jews were wanting... uh, They were wanting that during Jesus' first coming. But they didn't take advantage of it. And Jesus didn't come to to reign. He didn't come to be the king. He was the king of the Jews. But what did he do on his first coming? He came to die. He came as the servant of the Lord. Peter is essentially saying this. If you want that kingdom, 
If you want that millennial kingdom, if you want that messianic kingdom, if you want the kingdom, you have to have the king. You ever thought about that? They wanted the kingdom, but they didn't want the king. Sadly, the Jews rejected their king during his first coming, so they could not have it. In addition to these times of refreshing, they would experience the joys of Christ's return. Christ's second coming. We sang about that this morning. Look at me in verse 20 through 21. Picks up in the middle of verse 20. He says, And that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Who is the Christ? Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. When Israel repents, Jesus will return to the earth and establish his millennial kingdom. Now, some of you are saying, well, what are we doing here? Let's, let's get on a plane and get to the Holy Land and, and, and start evangelizing to these Jews if that's what we're waiting on. But we know that God's timetable is fixed. And we know through prophetic scriptures like the book of Revelation that uh, this, certain things have to take place before Christ returns. This goes along with the times of refreshing. And many people are going to repent. The majority of Israel is still going to re reject Jesus as their Messiah. So therefore, what are we doing now? We are waiting. We are waiting. But the good news is, in the book of Revelation, we see that during this great time of tribulation that I don't plan on being here for, this great time of tribulation is going to be worse than anything the world has ever experienced. We read in Scripture there's also going to be one of the greatest revivals ever. Not one of the greatest revivals ever. The greatest revival ever. During this time where the Antichrist is going to be reigning, people are going to be bowing down, taking the mark of the beast. There are going to be people, Jewish people, evangelists, the 144,000, preaching Christ. Preaching Christ. And thousands upon thousands. And people, we can't even number the number folks that are going to come to Jesus. That's not just Gentiles, but that is Jews. Jesus himself said in his scriptures he would not return until Israel acknowledged him as the Messiah. Look at the verses, Matthew chapter 23, verse 39. He's speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking to the Jewish people here. Listen to what the king has to say to these people. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus himself said, I'm not coming back until you acknowledge who I am. He was the king of the Jews. He was the king of the Jews. That means the Jews have to know who their king is. Peter tells the people of the benefits of repenting, but let's uh, go to our final point today. The people's prophetic inheritance. Peter is finally going to appeal to the prophets He's telling the people to repent. He's telling them the benefits of repentance. But then he's going to go to the scriptures and give them even more reason to repent. In the remaining verses, Peter's going to explain how all the prophets, starting from Moses to Samuel, all the prophets pointed to Christ. These prophets, they belonged to Israel. And who did they speak to? They spoke to Israel. In verse 25, Peter says, You are the sons of the prophets. But this doesn't mean they are the literal descendants of the prophets. This doesn't mean they were part of a, a prophetic group or guild. Uh, but this means they were the heirs of the prophets' promises. They were the heirs. They were the recipients of all the things that the prophets had to say. Uh, what did Peter say at the, at the end of this passage in verse 26? He says, God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first. First. To bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. The Jews were the original recipients of God's promises. They were the sons and daughters of the prophets. They were the ones that were first given the good news of the kingdom and the king. This collective message of the prophets affirmed the identity of Jesus as the Messiah. 
Uh, Peter just collectively says Moses, all the prophets. He even mentions Abraham. He mentions all of them. And it says they point to Jesus. And we know from where we stand in history that Jesus fulfilled countless of those prophecies when it came to being the Messiah. But sadly, the people rejected their own prophets and they rejected their own scriptures. Jesus even said this, you killed the prophets. You killed the prophets. They had the knowledge, but they didn't pay heed to it. Jesus fulfilled numerous Old Testament prophecies, uh, leaving the nation without excuse. Uh, To the unbelieving Jews, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is these that bear witness of me. John chapter 5, verse 39. Then in Luke's gospel, he's speaking to two of his disciples after the resurrection. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets... Jesus explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Israel's problem was not moral. It was, excuse me, Israel's problem was moral, not intellectual. They lacked repentance, not information. And folks, that is our same problem today. We too lack in morality. We too, we have all the information that is needed. We have the complete word of God. Moreover, uh, we have so much education. We have so many resources to help us understand the word of God. We have the information. We're just not doing what we're supposed to do. We know what we're supposed to do, but we don't do it. Our problem is not a lack of information, but it's a lack of of repentance. The message is clear. It was clear to the Jews and it's clear to us today. We are to repent of our sins and turn to Christ. For some, you've already done that. You've already done that. You've come to Christ. You are saved. But what do we do as saved people? Does that repenting just stop at that Sunday morning you said yes to Jesus? Newsflash, if you're not aware of this, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. For those who have made that commitment to Christ, uh, He is your King. But what do you do each and every day? You battle against sin. You battle against the devil. If you don't know, if there's not a battle in your life, I'm not sure you're you're on the right team. (laughs) Because I know I battle every single day. But for others of you today, you've never made that commitment to Christ. You've never come to Him as your Lord and Savior. And you can honestly say where you sit today, Pat, preacher, I wake up every morning, I don't battle. I tap out, I give in to whatever the devil brings my way. Can I tell you this? You don't have to keep living like that. You can be committed, you can be saved, you can be made new in Christ. I heard a, heard a young man in my Sunday school class, he's uh, witnessing uh, Gideon Perrin talking to a coworker, and, and said the young man after he was being told the gospel he said this is too easy this is too easy this is too easy I come to Jesus and I'm saved yes it's that easy it's that easy but what I was thinking of after you're saved ooh man it's, it's hard it's hard there is a battle every single day repentance is daily. Repentance lasts a lifetime. But folks, that is why I'm looking forward to glory. That is, do you ever think about what it's going to feel like when the weight of sin has been lifted off of you? You ever think about what that's going to feel like? It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. But as long as we live in this fallen world until Jesus comes back and brings us back to glory, we live in His power And we live daily in turning from sin. So I want to say this. If you haven't made that commitment, if you haven't turned from your sin and turned to Jesus for salvation, you can do that today. And going back to the Jews in this story, they were clearly guilty. 
They were clearly guilty. I want you to picture yourself in a courtroom right now before a judge who is the Lord. And he's not going to need a jury. He is the jury. He is the judge. And you know what he's going to, you know what he would read for everybody here today? Guilty. Guilty. But the good news is if, if you have Christ, your story doesn't end with guilty. Your story ends with amazing grace that is available for everyone. So I don't know why you would want to stand that trial without Jesus. Let us pray.